um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where in the country you're tuning in from. Um, I wanted to say thank you for joining us today for this 30-minute OSHA on-site consultation program. My, um, my name is Carol Wilkins. I'm the project manager here at MIA, and um, I'll be your moderator today. Um, our speaker today is Scott McNulty from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, the OSHA on-site consultation program here um, in um, Columbus, Ohio. He is an industrial safety consultant since 2013. He began his career in the United States Air Force as a ground safety technician and um, later became a, 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 a compliance officer with OSHA um, in 2007. He has conducted nearly 500 inspections and include, that includes accidents and fatalities. And Scott holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in management from Newman University. Um, I just want to also note that Scott is from the state of Ohio, so um, some of the references in the presentation will uh, more or less refer to Ohio, but um, please note that the same program is available in, um, in your state, in all 50 states. Um, in order for us to have the best uh, session today, we encourage you to um, participate, so if you have any questions, Please use the chat feature on your dashboard. And um, lastly, just want to point out to anyone on the phone that's um, interested in becoming a um, MIA accredited member, this is this is part of your um, accreditation process. Anyhow, with that, I will turn it over to Scott and say welcome. Scott? Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol, and uh, thanks to everybody out there for um, signing up for the webinar. Um, I'm going to talk about a service today that uh, not many people know about, or if they know about it, you know, um, it's kind of like, you know, when people need safety, that's when they call us up after, you know, when they need it, absolutely need it. So um, they give us a call. But this is a free service. Um, it is federally funded. Um, I'm with the uh, Division of Safety and Hygiene with the Bureau of Workers Comp in, in Ohio. And um, it is called OSHA Onsite Consultation. The reason it has the name OSHA in front of it is because we are 90% federally funded by the, uh, by the government and 10% uh, funded by the, uh, the state. So every state um, in the union has some type of consultation program because it's built into the 1970. OSH Act, which says that you'll have, you know, the Secretary of Labor states that there'll be consultation services provided. So, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second, how to, how to, how to do that. But like I said, it's free. Um, Quick Takes OSHA has a, a, a bi-weekly newsletter they put out, and they recently had a, a section in there about OSHA's free on-site consultation program. It helped 30,000 employers in 2015. And some, like Pennsylvania, I know they work out of a university. Uh, we work out of the Bureau of Workers' Comp, which is like kind of like an insurance agent, agency for the state of Ohio. And um, so there's other, whatever state you're in, um, I don't know what entity they're tied to, if it's federal or state agencies, but like I said, all states have some type of consultation program that you can call on for um, service. Um, we are separate from enforcement. Um, as Carol mentioned, I was uh, with enforcement in 2007. I joined with OSHA and was with them for five years. I mostly did construction inspections and um, not too many people like enforcement. Um, I liked working with the people, but a lot of people weren't happy to see me when I drove up on their job site, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, when people think of OSHA, they normally just think of the enforcement aspect of it. Uh, the consultation service is uh, we're not going to give out citations and penalties, and uh, you actually have to invite us into your workplace. We're just not going to show up unannounced. Um, the way to find out about your consultative program in your area is to go to the OSHA website, of course, and uh, go to the on-site consultation program office. Um, it's at the bottom of this slide. Um, how do you have to do that? Um, like I said, we don't give out citations or penalties, and you know, 
we're not going to guarantee you will pass the OSHA inspection. Um, we do visits. Sometimes they're comprehensive. Sometimes they're limited. Um, and uh, so we might not even see a particular hazard in your workplace. That's why we wouldn't guarantee that you would you would pass one. Uh, stone industry. Um, since I've been with OSHA, I know there have been a couple fatalities in the uh, Ohio area. Um, concerning uh, the stone industry. As you can see from this slide in 2015, quite a number of fatalities. And if you kind of look at the preliminary description of incident, I think they're all related to getting crushed by a slab of granite, okay? Loading, unloading, uh, you know, forklifting, things like that, and getting crushed by it. So it's common. That's the most common, you know, biggest way somebody's going to get killed. Um, in this industry is is that way. Um, for that reason, OSHA has published a couple of, they call them SHIBs or Safety and Health Information Bulletins that um, hope, I think you get this slide presentation. Uh, so you can click on these links and find these different uh, bulletins, the safety bulletins. And the two at the top here, uh, transporting granite, marble slabs, and Unloading, storing, and handling granite, uh, those are the things that are, you know, getting people, you know, hurt in the stone industry. Some of the other things that um, OSHA would look at with this industry are, of course, forklift. Uh, make sure everybody's trained on it. Make sure the forklift's in good operation and working condition. Make sure you have an inspection program with your forklift uh, program. Make sure people are, you know, trained and every three years and initially when they drive the forklift. Uh, the other thing is personal protective equipment. I recently went to a uh, stone industry uh, operation, and I, the guy was walking actually alongside a forklift and uh, with the with the transporting some granite, and he didn't have uh, steel toed boots on. So um, that would be something PPE, uh, gloves, glasses, boots, uh, necessarily maybe hard hats, maybe doing PPE assessments in the workplace to find out what PPE you need. Some of the other hazards with the industry are, of course, scaffolding. Um, common violations with that are fully planked. Make sure you have access, guardrail system at 10 feet. HazCom program, that's pretty much throughout all your industries that you need a hazard communication program. If you have a chemical, uh, you want to make sure your employees know what the chemical is, know what the hazards are associated with it, and know how to protect themselves from those hazards. Uh, the two that go hand in hand with that uh, Hazard communication program would be Portland Cement and Silica. And the links all provided here would take you to these uh, sites on scaffolding, HazCon, Portland Cement and Silica, and give you a lot more information than I can give you possibly today on these things. Um, overview of our program we do have uh, safety consultants. Uh, Carolyn said I was a safety consultant since 2013 with the on site program. And we do have industrial hygienists as well. Uh, normally, we are going to work with a small high hazard industry, and there's a lot of uh, high hazard industries out there. Um, your particular industry would be probably one of them. I haven't looked to see if it is, but I believe it is. Uh, OSHA puts out a list every year that says what the high hazard industry list is based on injuries and illnesses. So when we come out to visit your facility, you have to invite us in, and some of the things we look at are, which we're going to talk about in a little bit greater details, are management, your safety and health management system, um, which is something that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, it's one of the things that we focus on. It's our cornerstone for uh, making a company a sharp company or a VPP company, uh, which parallels VPP, which we'll talk about. But uh, we're going to talk about that safety and health management system here in a minute. And that's in addition to all the OSHA regulations um, that you that you have to have in place. And it's, I mean, it's not a lot. I mean, it's, there's some regulations you have to have, obviously. Um, industrial hygienists, what they do is they conduct noise surveys. They do air monitoring, ventilation assessments, and um, other things, uh, uh, just uh, consulting on what engineering controls need to be put in place. Um, what's unique about OSHA Onsite? I mean, there's I've worked for private consultants. Um, we work with um, the BWC, which has their own safety consultants. Uh, one of the things I like to brag upon is that uh, we follow the, the vision and protocols of um, OSHA's strategic vision. So 
Um, we, we go to the same school. I mean, I'm pretty fortunate. I was a compliance officer, so I kind of know how they operate. But uh, for those who work with us and haven't been compliance officers, um, we go to the same schools. They know the same protocols, the same uh, things that the compliance officer is doing. We're going to follow the same protocol. So when you say you're getting an OSHA mock inspection, a lot of safety companies, I work for a private safety company, and they said, oh, we're giving this company a mock and OSHA inspection. Well, um, I like to think we're doing it better because 90% um, of our funding is from federal OSHA. So they kind of uh, give us our marching orders and what we have to do. With that, um, we do have an opening conference, a walkthrough, and a closing conference, just like a OSHA enforcement inspection would have. Uh, the biggest thing with that is uh, explaining the rights and responsibilities that, you know, uh, using our services that we tell the employer that they, they need to do. So um, the rights and obligation, basically the, the employer has to invite us in and they can also, you know, throw us out anytime they want to. If they don't like what we're doing or don't think our service is valuable, they can, you know, ask us to leave, that we have to be invited in, we just don't show up. Obligations are, which I'll go into in a minute, um, when we walk around and doing a hazard survey, we determine, uh, categorize different hazards in various ways and then work with the employer to get those uh, fixed. Um, so when we're on site, we're looking at, we're going to walk through facility, look at the programs that may or may not be needed at your facility, look at your injury illness logs, that's often a big uh, telltale sign of you know how safe this company is. I was in a company two days ago, and they have a corporate safety director. And um, I looked at their injury illness logs, and they were twice the national average. So and when I walked around, there was you know plenty of hazards. I was there for a couple hours, and uh, we quickly got about 15 different things that they need to they need to work on: fall protection, electrical issues. Um, Trying to think of some other things that we that I found, but primarily those. Um, but looking at those logs, it's like, well, are you guys like investigating? You know, when accidents happen, how to fix them? They told me they were, but you know, they didn't have a good year. They had 2015. They had you know twice the national average for injury and illnesses. So that's something we look at. Um, safety and health management system, which we'll talk about here in a minute. We look at that as well. Uh, part of our walkthrough, uh, we encourage employees to, you know, for unions especially, if, if you have a union shop and enforcement did come out, they would, you know, require the union to kind of walk around with the compliance officer. We do the same thing. Uh, we don't make them do it, but if they want to do it, you know, we, we encourage them to participate. And uh, we do ask employees questions when we're on the in the facility about how, how things work. Uh, uh, work with safety and health in that particular company. Uh, so we do interview employees, not not to the extent that the compliance officer would, but we do ask them some basic questions. Like if they're driving a forklift, we ask them, did you get certified? Do you do an inspection? You know, things like that. Have you had any near misses? You know, things like that, we ask them. Our scope of our visit is limited to uh, we do a couple different visits. Normally, we'll come into a company once a year. We do an initial safety visit. Okay, we could do a first full service wall to wall inspection. I like to do limited inspections because number one, it's it's, it's time consuming. I mean, it's less time consuming for us. Number two is I don't want to like overload employers with a big laundry list of stuff to do. If I'm walking around a facility and I see that there's a lot of things going on here and a lot of things that need to be corrected. I'll like say, I'll say, hey, we've got enough stuff here. Let's work on this stuff and maybe I can come back and do some other stuff later. We can work with you as many times as you want during the year, but the first visit is always an initial visit in which we um, do evaluate the health and safety management system and and do what the employer wants us to do. We do follow-up visits after that. So, like, let's say in that scenario I just gave you, if we came out and there was a lot of stuff that needed to be done and we picked and chose what we needed to have, prioritize, and we need to come back for a follow-up at six months or three months or whatever whatever time frame the employer wants us to come back and, and do some additional stuff with that. 
Uh, other services uh, we do, uh, we do some limited training and um, and help with PPE assessments and things like that. That's part of our, our services. Uh, the way we categorize our uh, findings, I think one of the handouts is a um, visit that we do. We don't call, we don't call, we call our visits visits. OSHA calls them inspections, enforcement end, but we call them visits. Um, we categorize them as serious, other than serious. Uh, there's regulatory things like record keeping, and then there's other findings and recs. Normally, that's general duty clause violations, like those SHIBs we had that we looked at at the beginning of the presentation. Those would be under um, a general duty clause, a 5A1 type of violation. The serious ones, uh, categorization-wise, we um, we work with the employer to get those, you know, fixed. Normally, 45 days are allowed, but we do extensions on them if the employer needs more time to fix them. Other than serious, normally, any type of program deficiency I'm going to find, let's say forklift has come, uh, some other programs that might be on there, I'm going to put on a other than serious um, type of violation, and then. There's no timeline to fix them, but if OSHA enforcement did come in there, they could cite it serious. So uh, we say on here no timeline for correction, but we also put in a report that, hey, these are you know these are things that you need to, do need to get to, um, but get to them you know as soon as you can and, and and get them get them corrected. We don't have any requirement for you to report back on it, but if I came out there like the following year and saw that hey, you guys didn't implement your forklift program like I wanted, you know, we might up that to a serious finding and then you'd have, you know, 45, 60 days to get it in place. But uh, normally, the first time around, we're going to do other than serious, so you have plenty of time to work on it. Um, so after we do our hazard uh, survey, we call it, um, we look at the, uh, the hazards, uh, categorize them, and then kind of agree on what needs to be done. Interim protection means that, like the other day I went out and uh, saw they needed some fall protection, uh, things on various mezzanines, and interim protection is either don't go up there and expose your employees to falls or have them use some type of fall protection other than the guardrail system. But the long-term fix for the ones that I've been talking about would be a guardrail system. But interim protection means protect your employees. We've discovered this hazard and uh, protect your employees in the uh, interim uh, area until you get it fixed. We do provide a detailed report, which is one of the handouts that you will, that we have. You can look at that, and um, we give you recommendations and things how to fix it. Um, some of the things we do, we're going to, like I said, suggest general approaches for solving uh, issues. Um, with the state of Ohio, we do have additional services we can offer through the BWC, such as ergonomics and safety grants, and it's going to vary in your state what um, other resources are available to you when using the uh, consultation service. And then I'm uh, just going to assist people, and you know, I have programs, I've lock out, tag out, and HASCOM, and uh, basically forklift things, uh, forklift programs that, uh, you know, we always uh, give out to employers. If they need anything, we're going to do the research and get it to them. That's part of our customer service uh, stuff that we do when we're doing uh, visits. Let's talk about the safety and health management system. I did have a – I'm not sure. Safety and health management system is – I had a nice little triangle thing here, but it's, <laughs> it's not here. Uh, let me see if I can go back. Um, let's see if I maybe I skipped over it. Previous slide. Uh, there it is. Okay, the safety and health management system. Okay, so what this is, it's like a big cornerstone of what we do um, with the uh, consultation program. Uh, as you can see, I divide it up into three sections, and the top section is your injury illness. I call that like the tip of the iceberg. So when we have an injury or illness, there's always various reasons why these things happen. Um, a lot of employers that I visit, um, they're like, well, why did the employee get hurt? And I say, like, oh, it's just complacent. He wasn't paying attention. Well, as a safety professional, it's just not going to be acceptable. <laughs> People aren't complacent. Uh, things do happen, but most injuries are preventable. So what we do with our program, we have the injury illnesses at the top. We have the OSHA standards in the middle. 
And on the bottom, we have the safety and health management system, which is comprised of like five broad topics, which we can really break down into 58 different uh, type of individual bullet points that we go through. And this takes time to develop. Um, we're not going to come into a company and develop their safety and health management system in one visit, two visits, three visits, four visits. It's going to take time to develop this thing. Um, this is a non-mandatory part of um, what we do, and OSHA is now focusing on the safety and health management system a criteria, which is on one of your handouts that you can look at. Um, they are focusing and going towards that. I don't think any time in the near future they're going to ever, you know, they're not going to make this mandatory. But it's just a guideline to help uh, employers achieve a better, you know, safety program at their company. But part of the management system or part of the safety and health management system, one of the things is management leadership. Um, how does your management leadership demonstrate commitment uh, to continuous improvement and safety within the, you know, within the uh, work environment? There's all kinds of things you can do to do that. Normally, they can have written policies. Uh, basically, what ma what is management doing to make it look like to the employee like they care about safety? Are they sending? Are they giving them training? Are they uh, is safety like paramount in you know the way the company operates? Uh, the other aspect to the safety and health management system is worker participation. That can happen in various ways too. Um, safety committees, open door policy, um, having employees do frequent regular inspections. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, ways that workers can participate in safety in the company. That's one of the things that we do look at when we're looking at this uh, system here. Um, the other two things uh, with the safety and health management system is um, basically the first one, hazard identification assessment. That's basically um, inspections that you're doing. How often are you inspecting for hazards? You know, are you identifying hazards? Hazard prevention and control, that's kind of like the existing stuff that you have in place already. Let's say you have a work rule for employees to wear eye protection while they're, you know, at the plant or doing a various activity or whatever. Um, are the employees actually following the rules that you have established? Um, a lot of times, like I, I go into a place and hearing protection is supposed to be worn in one area. I was at a place recently where they had like 10 employees in one area that they're supposed to be wearing hearing protection, but nobody had it on. So, you know, you ask yourself, why aren't these people wearing hearing protection as part of the, you know, they had a hearing assessment done. It was over 85 decibels. They're supposed to wear it. You know, why aren't they wearing it? So that's one of the things we look at, too. Uh, education and training is the last element of the safety and health management system. And, you know, what kind of uh, training are you giving your employees? Um, we recommend when we go into companies, we're fortunate in the state of Ohio. We have the Bureau of Workers' Comp. does a lot of our training. They have 10-hour courses, 30-hour courses, specialty courses. So we're pretty fortunate here in the state of Ohio that we can send people to these courses, you know, that are free. Uh, you know, it does cost money to send a person there, you know, getting their, their time away from the job. But otherwise, there's no charge for the course itself. So what kind of training is the company, you know, giving their employees? That's something else we look at for the health and safety management system. Well, one thing that they're adding to the new safety and health management system is what kind of process do you have to make sure you have continuous improvement um, in your program. It's kind of like a risk management type thing. Um, and then another aspect of it is uh, when I used to do um, construction inspections with enforcement, uh, multi-employer work sites, um, if I drove up to a work site and saw somebody on a roof and without fall protection and then I saw the general contractor standing below them watching the guy without fall protection, uh, that company gets cited too. So a multi-employer work sites, uh, whoever the general contractor is on that work site, they have a responsibility to make sure that um, even their subs are being protected. So that's what that, that's about. Um, which brings me to our achievement, our SHARP program, which parallels VPP, which is the Voluntary Protection Program that OSHA has, enforcement side runs it. We, we run the SHARP program, which is a safety and health achievement recognition program. Uh, our companies that are in the SHARP program, there's about 30 or so. 
Um, basically, they're meeting all these requirements of the safety and health management system we just talked about. Uh, they meet all those requirements and then they become um, a SHARP program. Of course, the most important qualifier to that is to make sure that um, their injury and illnesses are below the national average um, on a consistent basis. So we take like a, a four-year snapshot of the company's injury and illnesses and then we uh, make sure that, you know, they have the safety and health management system in place, they have their OSHA standards in place, and, you know, the last four years they've had, you know, below the industry um, average for their injuries and illnesses. That's how you qualify and become a sharp measure uh, or sharp company. Um, OSHA does, federal OSHA does recognize you um, for uh, becoming a sharp company. They give you a, uh, you're recognized as a sharp company. The area office in your jurisdiction knows that you're a sharp company. I mean, you are afforded some. I guess some perks, like if, uh, if somebody called, there may be a complaint about something, they may, the enforcement office may, you know, um, give you a phone and fax as opposed to sending an um, inspector out there. But whatever protocol they follow, um, they, do re they do know that you're a sharp company and do respect you for that. So uh, some of the uh, indirect, um, I guess, um, benefits of being a sharp company is, um, protecting your workers. Um, you get to work with OSHA to identify and implement best practices uh, for your workers. That's working with us. Um, and you're developing an injury and uh, prevention program, which a lot of companies don't have. Um, creates a better working environment. You're going to boost your worker morale, improve communication. That's where that uh, worker participation comes in. And then it encourages safety in the community because if you have a safe work, work environment, you're going to have a safer uh, home environment as well. You do receive official recognition from OSHA, and um, you become a leader in your industry and, and safety. And a lot of people uh, time, uh, today, I mean, if you are bidding on a job, a lot of places want to know, you know, hey, what's your safety record? What do you have in place for safety? Um, we get a lot of phone calls like that. It's like, hey, I'm bidding on a job, and the, the questionnaire they sent me said, you know, what are we doing for safety? And so they turn to us, and we try to help develop you know, their safety program. So um, that's pretty much, much it for the presentation. Um, Carol, we can open up to questions if you'd like to. Um, but thank you very much for uh, allowing me to do this. And uh, if you want a on-site visit in the state of Ohio from me, give me a call. There's my number there at the bottom of the screen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, thanks, Scott. Um, and now. We'll open it up if you have any questions. Um, feel free to use the question box um, and ask your questions. I'll give it a few minutes because um, I know sometimes it takes a while to come up with a question. Okay. Um, so a question from Tracy. Yes, the PowerPoint will be available. You'll get a copy of not only the PowerPoint but um, the presentation itself um, and an evaluation after after the webinar. If you have any um, questions regarding if you're going through the accreditation process and, um, you know, if there's anything that you have questions to that maybe Scott didn't cover, um, now's your time to do so. And then also if you're calling from the state of, or if you're listening from the state of Ohio, um, feel free to call Scott at the information online. Um, to set up a on-site consultation with him directly. And, um, yeah, I don't see. I have one more question coming in. One, one second. Jay asks, what do you recommend for um, an air hose in the shop. Scott? Um, well, 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 of course, the 30 PSI rule um, have a, you know, a restrictor on there that limits the, uh, if you're doing it for cleaning uh, below 30 PSI, you can buy that like at Home Depot or something like that. Um, also, the cl I mean, the big one of the bigger things is clamps on there. A lot of people like to put those uh, clamps on they use for like repairing car hoses. Um, those are not suitable for air hoses. So 
those are the two big things that come to mind, the 30 PSI restriction and having the proper clamping on the air hose itself. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. It doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. Um, oh, wait. Um, wait. Can water... Uh, hold on a second. It says, "Can water and hair hose be on on the floor?" Can water and where? And the air hose be on the floor? Uh, well, I mean, one of the things you look for uh, there are standards that get, you know saying that you know water has to have you know the floor has to have proper drainage. I know that in the stone industry there frequently is water issues um, and people install drains and uh, keep those floors you know as, as water free as possible but um, that's something yeah that would be an issue uh, and you said the air hose on the floor I mean if you mm -hmm. have tripping hazards or whatever I mean I, I'd have to see the condition but we don't want a tripping hazard on the floor and we don't want you know uh, extremely wet conditions um, on floors without proper drainage so those are the two things that come to mind when you mention that. Okay. All right. Um, so I guess with that, we'll bring it to a close if we don't have any more um, questions. And okay. I just want to say thank you again, Scott. I appreciate it. And um, look forward to seeing everyone at the next webinar. Thank you. All right.